Radioactive decay. You have n0 particles that have a half-life of t1 half. So you start with n0 particles and the half-life is t1 half. How many of the original particles are left after t1 half, or sorry, after t equals t1 half over 2? Now, there's a trap. You are tempted to say, well, the half-life is how long it takes for half of them to be gone. So half of the half-life, a quarter of them will be gone, so there'll be three quarters left. And so you'll say three quarters of them will be left, and that will be wrong. Why, you say? Well, let's think about it. What really happens is that it's an exponential decay. And then this is the half-life right here, t1 half, see if I can draw it right. And we want to say, oh, well, OK. If this is t1 half, um, and the, it's got to actually start, so let's see, let's make it start at the right place. Right, so this is half of that. Well, let's look at when would three quarters be left. And notice because of the way this is curving here, this is actually less time than that. Oh, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, so how do we deal with this, right? Well, I mean, by saying three quarters, we've implicitly assumed it's a linear decay. So if, um, if it had been a straight line from here to here, then yes, the three quarters here would have been exactly half. But it's not a straight line, it's this curve. So how do we really deal with this? Well, let's actually look at the math of it. So the math of it says that the number of particles left is equal to the number we start with times e to the minus t over tau. And then how does tau relate to the half-life? Well, um, the, ha the half-life is just equal to tau times the natural log of 2. Now, it turns out there's a more natural way to think about this, actually. Um, that you can just write the equation entirely in terms of 2 to the minus t over t one-half, right? And so if I plug in t one-half for t, I get n equals n zero times 2 to the minus 1, so at t equals t one-half, n is n equal to n zero times two to the minus t one-half over t one-half is two to the minus one is n zero over two, and then that just works perfectly. So you can use this equation instead of um, the, the equation with the e if you want with the half-life, um, except that then it'll, well, it'll turn into the other equation naturally anyway. And the reason that works, um, well, here's what I'm gonna do. We want to find the, the t such that, or no, we want to figure out what happens at uh, one half of t one half. So let's just, let's just, we can actually plug into this case. We don't even have to worry about the e. So it's uh, two to the minus um, t one half divided by two divided by t one half. Well, that's kind of messy there. But the t one halves cancel. We'll get n zero times two to the minus one half, which is the same as n zero over the square root of 2. Um, how many of the original particles are left? I'm just going to, that's actually the answer, that's fine. What is 1 over the square root of 2? If I remember correctly, it's something like 0 0.7 and 0. So let me just check that real quick. Yes, I did remember correctly. If you want more digits, it's 0 0.707 and 0. So as we predicted looking at it, it's a little less than 3 quarters is what's left half a half-life later. Interesting. Okay, problem B is easy. Um, at t equals t one half, n zero over two particles are left because that's the definition of the half life. Um, next, C at t equals one point five t one half. So I'm going to write one point five as three halves, right? So at t equals three halves t one half, the number left is going to equal to n zero times two. Um, to the minus three halves, because there's a t one half over t one half in there, which is equal to n zero. So minus three halves is the same as one over two cubed, because the, that's the one half there. So that's n zero over the square root of eight. Uh, and so the square root of eight is gonna be a wee bit less than three, because the square root of nine is three, so I'll stick that in my calculator. To three sig figs, you would say that's 0 0.354 and 0. And then d at t equals 2 t 
T one half. Now this is another trap. This is the one where you say, oh, in a half-life, the first half will go away, so in the second half-life, the other half goes away, there'll be none left. And you would say zero, and that would be wrong. Because really what happens is, every half-life, half of the particles go away. So in the first half-life, half of them go away. So now you're starting with half as many. In another half-life, half of what's left go away, so you'll have a quarter what you started with, right? Because half of half is a quarter. If I did the math, I'll get the same thing. It's uh, 2 to the minus 2, because it's minus 2 t1 half over t1 half. This was like 2 to the t1 half. Let me write that better. 2 t1 half. It was 2 t1 half divided by t1 half, so that goes away. And 2 to the minus 2 is 1 over 2 squared, which is 1 fourth. Or if you insist on writing it as a decimal, it would be that. Okay, so um, that's what, if given these times, you could figure out what's, how many is left just by doing two to the something. Now, what about the whole E equation? Why could I use this equation instead of the E equation? Well, okay, here is why. Let me just, um, let's remember, let's remember what natural log really means. So if I say that Y is equal to E to the X, that is the same thing as saying that the natural log of y is equal to x. They're inverse operations. What natural log means is to what power do I have to raise e to get my number? That's what natural log means. All right, so now let's think about another thing. I'm going to erase some of this so I have some room to work with this. Remember that if you have a to the b times c, that's the same as a to the b to the c, right? So if you have something to powers to other powers, you multiply the powers. Um, if you don't believe that, here's just an example. If you take 2 cubed squared, well, 2 cubed is 8, which I'm going to write as 2 times 2 times 2. That's 2 cubed. And we're squaring it, so I have to multiply it. So that's what that would be. Well, that's 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is 2 to the 6, which is the same as 2 to the 3 times 2. I haven't proved this. I've just given an example of where this works. Right. So given that that is true, if I want to write, instead of E, I want to write 2 here. Um, well, how do I write 2 in terms of E? Well, if I write oops, E to the ln 2, that I just get 2. So therefore, I could write e to the x as um, e to the ln2 times x over ln2, right? I've just multiplied and divided by ln2, is equal to 2 to the x over ln2. All right. So given that, if I start with, I'm going to do a different color here. If I start with n0, sorry, n, is equal to n0 e to the minus t over tau. I'm going to play the same game here. I'm going to multiply and divide by ln2. I get n0 e to the ln2 to the minus t over ln2 tau, right? So you see when I multiply these out, the ln2s will cancel. But then that's just 2, so that's n0 times 2 to the minus t over ln2. I want to put parentheses here to make it clear that tau is not inside the ln times tau. And ln2 times tau is exactly t1 half. Uh, that's what I told you in class. So that's why this is really the same thing as this. And it's just for the first four parts of this problem, it's actually equal easier to work with the, uh, with the two. But I could have, by just calculating tau, since I know t1 half, I could have just actually figured out what um, I could have figured out what tau was and just use that. Now, part D, I am going to use the E formulation, I think. We'll see. How long does it take so that fewer than one millionth of the original particles will be around? So we want to say how long, this is part E, how long for n is equal to 10 to the minus 6 n naught. Right? That's 1 1 millionth, means there's 1 1 millionth of n naught is left. So we have n is 10 to the minus 6 n naught has to equal n naught times e to the minus t over tau. All right, what I'm after here is t. So 
Well, it's stuck up here in an E. I divided both sides by n naught. I'll just write it again. Once I get it so E is all by itself, now that's important, you have to have E all by itself. If I take a natural log of both sides, I get ln 10 to the minus 6 is equal to minus t over tau. Um, or, I have to erase more to make more space for myself. All right, so what we're after is t, so let's just solve this for t. So t is equal to minus tau times the natural log of 10 to the minus 6. But then also remember that what is tau? Well, okay, so we know that t 1 half is equal to ln 2 times tau, which is equal to 0 0.691, is that right? Mm, 693 tau. I'm sort of violating my rules by mixing numbers and variables, but I'll, I'll survive somehow. So that's t1 half is 0.693 tau, and why do I do that? It's because t1 half is the thing I know. So that's equal to minus t1 half divided by 0.693, and I also need to know what is the natural log of 10 to the minus 6. The natural log of 10 to the minus 6 is minus 13.8. So when I divide 13.8 by 0.693, I get 20 to two sig figs. So this is why, oh, maybe it wasn't so bad to plug in numbers. It turns out I kind of worked the problem out this way. So that's the question. To have less than one one millionth left of what you started, you have to go 20 times, 20 half-lives. Um, so if you take two to the one, if you take two to the 20, you should get about a million. And, um, yeah, that's right, from what I remember from computer memory. Don't worry about it. Okay, so anyway, that's, that's the fourth part of the problem, is that if you want to have this many left, and this is how you set these up, how many do I have left? This many. I can put it in here, and then just solve it, and then I use a log. The second problem gets at some really cool fundamental early universe stuff. Why do we believe the Big Bang was is a good description of the history of our universe? A few different reasons. There's a few pieces of observational evidence. One of them is that if you look at primordial gas clouds, which is gas clouds that haven't had a lot of star formation, which is important for reasons, um, the ratio of helium to hydrogen is very close to what you'd predict from the Big Bang. The prediction from the Big Bang is dominated by what we're going to think about in this problem. So, okay, so the idea is here is one um, universe equals one second old. What we have is we have protons and neutrons. I'll do protons open. Um, and they're all zipping around really fast. And there's also lots of electrons and there's lots of photons and, and other things, but we'll just think about these. And they're all zipping around really fast. Every so often, a proton and a neutron will stick, making a deuteron, um, which is the first part of doing fusion all the way up to helium. But shortly thereafter, a photon, and it's probably a photon because it turns out there's way more photons than everything else, will come along and blast them apart because the photons have so much energy that they blast them apart. Then later, um, what do I say, 270 seconds later, you're still left with mostly um, protons, you have the occasional deuteron, and you have the occasional helium nucleus, which is like that, and, and some other stuff. Um, but you have no, f well, you have basically no free neutrons anymore. There's, there's a, the, uh, yeah, you have no free neutrons anymore. But here's the key, is that now things are all still moving around, but now the photons are longer wavelength. The photons don't have as much energy. Why? Redshift. Take the galaxies in cosmology class. We'll talk a lot about it. But the universe has cooled off, basically. The universe cools off as it expands. The photons no longer have enough energy to blast these guys apart, so everything that's together just sticks. And here's the thing. There's no free neutrons. All the neutrons that would be there are, they'll eventually stick to one of the protons and make something heavier. And we're going to assume, and this is not a bad assumption, that it's all helium. Um, yeah, there's some deuterons, but we're going to ignore that. So we're going to assume that all the neutrons get used up in helium. So here's the key. 
you have the number of neutrons is equal to the number of protons divided by 7 at this time. Here, what's the number of neutrons? Um, well, and so first of all, we don't know the number of neutrons. We'll come back to that. But all of the neutrons are in helium. So let's think about what this means. So each helium, so the number, well, we'll say each helium has two protons plus two neutrons. And each hydrogen just has one proton. So the number of hydrogens is going to equal the, uh, sorry, the number of protons is equal to the number of hydrogens plus two times the number of heliums, right? Because there's two protons per heliums. Whereas the number of neutrons is equal to two times the number of heliums. Okay, and so then, and so what I'm really after, what I ultimately ask in this question is I'm looking for what is the ratio of the number of heliums to the number of hydrogens? And we can get that from this. So I'm going to start with um, the number of neutrons over the number of protons. Here's one key is the number of protons doesn't change. So during this time, two things happen. One, protons don't change. Neutrons decay. And what do they decay into? Into protons. plus an electron, plus an antineutrino, but we don't care about that. So the neutrons decay into protons. Um, and then the other thing is what I already told you, that the universe uh, cools off. And then the third thing is that neutrons all get incorporated into helium during this time. But because the neutrons are decaying, and it's just like a radioactive decay, we can figure out what is the number of neutrons divided by the number of protons Although, here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the number of neutrons is equal to the number of neutrons at time zero. You say, wait, wait, it's time t equals one second. Well, here's the thing. 270 seconds versus one second when we have one sig fig. This is basically the same as time zero, so let's just not worry about that. Um, e to the minus t over tau. And so what I'm going to do is, actually, here's what I can really do, is just put in 269 seconds for t, because this is 269 seconds later. That's great. The number of protons is equal to the number of protons zero plus the number of neutrons, sorry. Uh, yeah, the, well, here, here's what it is. Plus the number of neutrons that have decayed. This is the number that's left. So the number that has decayed is equal to um, nn minus nn zero. Right, nn is how many are left. I did that backwards. nn is how many are left. And zero is how many you started with, so that's the number that has decayed. All right, so that's the number of protons. That's the number of neutrons. And the quantity we know is the, the number of neutrons divided by the number of protons. All right, so let's see what we can do with this. So I'm going to erase a bunch of my pictures. We want to keep this because it's important. We want to keep this and this because it's important. And we want to keep this. And we want to remember that t is, we'll say here, t is equal to 269 seconds, because that's the time between one second and 270 seconds. Okay, so that's, that's setting all this up. We start with protons and neutrons all mixed. 270 seconds go by. Some of the neutrons decay because neutrons are not stable. Free neutrons are not stable. Neutrons in nuclei are stable. They stay there unless it's a radioactive nucleus. But most, all the small ones that we know and love, Neutrons are stable, but free neutrons are not. So some of the neutrons decay. So 270 seconds la uh, later, you have fewer neutrons than you started with. And all of the neutrons get incorporated into other nuclei, and we're going to assume it's all helium because that's a decent approximation. Yeah, there's some deuterons, but we're going to assume it all goes into helium. Given these numbers, right, so that's the picture of what's happening. How do we turn this picture into math? Well, we say, so the number of protons later is, is the number of hydrogen plus twice the number of heliums, because each helium has two protons. And the number of neutrons is twice the number of heliums. OK, that's how you relate these things. How do we relate these to other things we know? The number of neutrons is however many we started with, e to the minus t over tau. The number of protons is however many we started with, plus however many neutrons decayed, which is the number we started with minus the number we have left. The difference is how many decayed in that time. And then the one other thing, I'm going to write this number down here so it's all in one place. The number of, of neutrons 
divided by the number of protons when we start is one seventh. So we know relative to protons how many we started with, we can figure out how many decay, we ought to be able to figure out what these are. So let's now play with the math and see if we can make that work. So we think about what do we really know, and this, and what I should say here is this is nn0 n divided by np0. So we know this number and we know this number. We don't know this number or this number necessarily. And what we, what we are after is the number of heliums divided by the number of hydrogens. That's what we're after. So let's solve these two for number of heliums and number of hydrogens. Well, so we know that the number of heliums is going to equal um, the number of neutrons divided by two, and that's the number of neutrons at 269 seconds. So 270 seconds minus the one second we started at. And then the number of neutrons, we can put this in. That's equal to nn0 divided by 2 times e to the minus t over tau. And tau is known. I'll look it up in the problem. All right, so that's nhe. Hey, that's great. So now let's see if we can figure out nh. Because now we have nhe entirely in terms of known stuff. Let's see if we can figure out nh. nh is equal to, well, if you look at this, np minus 2 times NHE. NP is this, is equal to NP0 um, plus NN0 minus NN. And then for NN is NN0 e to the minus t over tau. OK, so that's NP is just, right, this is NP from here. And then we have to subtract 2 times NEG, so that's minus NN0E to the minus T over tau, right, just from this. Multiply by 2, that 2 goes away. OK, so we have NH is equal to NP0 um, plus N0 times 1 minus 2 e to the minus t over tau, right? All I did is I put these two together to get that two and then factored out the n, n zero. This is good so far. So now what I'm gonna do is say that n h e divided by n h, I'm just gonna divide these two, is going to be n, n zero, e to the minus t over tau divided by that 2 from here times all of this, 2 times NP0 plus NN0 times 1 minus 2 e to the minus t over tau. And now you say, oh dear, but I don't know NN0 and NP0 separately. I only know the ratio. So here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by 1 over N0. And that will get this for me. So this whole thing here that is equal to e to the minus t over tau divided by 2 times np0 over n n0 plus um, 1 minus 2 e to the minus t over tau. Right, and here is our answer. Now, I know how you guys think, and I know that you think, oh my god, I didn't understand the video problem. I got mystified. Why? Because I just did a whole bunch of steps. You're like, what happened? So here's the thing. Don't start by telling yourself, I can't understand this, because then you won't. Think back. I know the first part was a little complicated, right? So I wrote down the pictures of what was going on in the universe, and I got these. But I'm hoping you understood how I got this. This is not too hard, right? The number of neutrons here, the number of protons, just by thinking about how many hydrogens and heliums you have. This is straight up radioactive decay. And this is realizing the neutrons decay to protons, so I have to add the protons that come. So that's how I got these equations done. Stop worrying about what came before. I know these things. These are things I know. Next, I thought, what do I need? I want this. And look, I have some of those variables in here, so I'm going to start playing the math games. I'm going to see NHE. Well, I can get NHE very simply from this equation, so good. And then NN, I eventually what I'm doing is I'm just substituting in stuff until I get it in terms of stuff I know. Well, hey, that's nice. And then NH, well, I start with this, 
And I do the same thing. I substitute stuff in. That's all this stuff that I was doing. You're thinking, oh my god, that was too complicated. There's one thing that's kind of a mess is that that equation all goes together in one. No, I'm substituting in stuff I know and then simplifying. And then I get this is the thing I want, and I say it's almost what I know, but really I, I want NP0 over NN0 because that's the thing I know. I don't know the actual number. It was infinite. In fact, if the universe is infinite, we don't want to go there. What we know is the ratio. That's what we can really measure. So I just get it to this, right? So the math games was just a subs repeated substituting and getting what I know to work it down to something I can get the numbers of. This was the part of setting it up, of thinking about at the beginning, not worrying about the answer at all. But just thinking about what's going on, how can I write this in terms of math, how can I relate it to radioactive decay. So now that I have this, I know all the numbers I need. Um, right, this number here is 7. Right, that's what that number in is. This number t is 269 seconds. And this number tau is, here's where I tell you, 880 seconds, I think. Uh, uh, 880 seconds. 880 seconds. That's good. And now I can just plug this. I should put units on it. Now I have enough. I can just plug it into my calculator. So I'm going to do that. All right. So when I put all the numbers in, what I get is I get a dead green pen. Bye. Um, NHE over NH equals 0 0.05 something, 0 0.0564, which we really only have about one sig fig in this problem, about like that one seventh, maybe two sig figs, but I'm going to keep it to three because it's an intermediate number. All right, so, right, so I just put in that for t, 269 seconds for t, 880 seconds for tau, and seven for np0 divided by nn0, the initial ratio of protons and neutrons. We get this. The problem actually asks what is the total mass of helium divided by the total mass of hydrogen. Well, that's going to equal the number of heliums times the mass of helium, the mass of one helium. That's what I mean by the lower case. I mean mass of one helium divided by the number of hydrogens times the mass of one hydrogen. So that's NHE over NH, which we just calculated, times M. H E over M H, and that's just four, right? There's four, two protons, two neutrons, one proton. I'm gonna erase this, we know it by now. So that's 0 0.0564 times four, which when you do that, you get 0 0.226. 0 0.226. All right, that is what we have calculated for the mass ratio of helium to hydrogen in the universe produced by the Big Bang, given the assumptions that I gave you. And, um, yeah, it says the more careful thing you get is 0.23. Hey, check it out, we got basically 0.23 anyway to two sig figs. Which means that, it means a couple things. One, it means I probably cooked the 1 7th to make it work right. But it also means that this really is the dominant consideration. So let's step back and think. Now again, I know, like I said, you guys probably saw this whole thing. You said, I didn't understand the video problem. And you looked at this. I had no idea how to start. But don't say this, okay? You can understand all of this. The key is that when you first look at it, knowing how you're going to get the total answer is um, not possible, probably, right? I mean, I knew because I've done this before. But I don't expect you to look at this and be able to see everything that just happened in your head. No way. So what you do, what do you do? You start by making sure you understand what's going on. And that, that, those early pictures I drew actually also included some additional explanation. But basically I'm saying, okay, we start with neutrons and protons. Good. 270 seconds later, all the neutrons were incorporated in helium. Okay. Good. So it's 270 seconds later, all neutrons will be part of helium, which, and the rest will be leftover protons, which is hydrogen. And then finally, the lifetime tau of the neutron is 880 seconds, what's the mass ratio? It's like, oh my god, how do I even deal with this? We'll start by drawing the pictures to make sure you understand what you're doing. Try and turn them into math. Hey, I got this equation here, which is not too difficult. This is 880 seconds after the, sorry, 270 seconds after the Big Bang. But then also, hey, wait a minute, neutron has a lifetime. That means I can use radioactive decay. I know about that. This is what, that's exactly what that is. 
and that's the number of neutrons, and oh, I'm going to need the number of protons, aren't I? Well, let's think about that too. That's this. Now that you have this, it's one step at a time. Understand each step. And if you understand each step, putting the steps together really is just making the whole thing work. Just make sure each step makes sense. Now that I have this together, I just did algebra, really. And the algebra I did was just subsequent substitutions getting it to where what I was after, which was this. And I have the answer. Um, so knowing only a little bit of radioactive decay, knowing what the ratio of protons to neutrons that started, and getting that number is a lot harder. Um, you need to know some thermal physics and such, but whatever. Um, if you know that one-seventh, the lifetime of the neutron, you can actually calculate what the mass fraction of helium to hydrogen is produced by the Big Bang. That is the second of three problems. Last problem. Carbon-14 is an isotope of carbon with half-life. We're going to talk about carbon dating, which is when um, you find carbon attractive and you call it up and say, hey, would you like to go out and see a movie? Maybe get a milkshake. Because, you know, carbon dating used to happen in the 50s. All right, carbon-14, and that's what people would actually die of, right? None of this cell phone text them pictures of you, and we don't want to talk about that. Okay, carbon-14 has a half-life. So it is radioactive of 5730 years. Okay, very good. Despite the fact that the Earth has been around long enough, as in four and a half billion years, way longer than that, for basically all of the carbon-14 in the atmosphere to decay, cosmic rays and high energy charged particles from the sun impacting our atmosphere create nuclear reactors that refresh the carbon-14. Maintaining the ratio, so in the atmosphere, because we're always making new carbon-14, charged particles coming in from the sun, and cosmic rays, which are from elsewhere, um, are always making new carbon-14. So in the atmosphere, the number of carbon-14 divided by the number of carbon-12, we'll call that number 14 divided by number 12, is 1.3 times 10 to the minus 12, right? So it's a trace contaminant, carbon, most carbon is carbon-12, there's a little bit of carbon-13, there's a trace contaminant of carbon-14, it's always being made and it's always decaying, so there's an equilibrium, right, the number being made and the number decay match, and it keeps that in the atmosphere. Alright, the carbon in the atmosphere is what plants use to build themselves, and the ecosystem at the surface of the earth is built on top of these plants. As such, all living things, I really should say all living things, on the surface of the Earth, because there's the whole deep sea smokers we're not worrying about, tend to have a ratio of this. However, once they die, they are no longer eating or otherwise consuming things, being kept in equilibrium with the atmosphere, right? So as long as you're alive, you're eating more carbon. Or if you're a plant, you're doing more uh, photosynthesis stuff and more pulling in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to build yourself. Um, so as long as you are alive, you are keeping yourself in equilibrium with the atmosphere by eating and breathing and all that good stuff. When you die, you stop. You're just, you're there. Or if you're a plant, you're just, you're there. And what's in you is in you. And it starts to decay away. Um, maybe predators come and eat pieces of it. Um, but in terms of your carbon, the carbon decays, it is not refreshed. The carbon-12 will stay, the carbon-14 will decay. And so we can use this to figure out how long ago something died. Right? Just by saying, we knew it, when it died, it had this ratio. Find the ratio now, use radioactive decay, figure out how long ago it died. So we'll do a couple examples of this. Suppose we have a sample that contains 10 grams of carbon. With a detector capable of detecting the electrons produced by beta decay of carbon-14, we detect 1.94 decays per second. What that tells me is that um, the number of decays in one second is equal to 1.94, right? So the number of decays divided by one second is 1.94, right? So the number of decays is 1.94 in one second, so that's, that's how you can write that. Okay, very good. Um, how old is this sample? Oh, well, very interesting. Well, first of all, we have 10 grams of carbon-12. So what is the total number of carbon-12? Well, 10 grams of carbon, but notice that carbon-14 is such a tiny contaminant that to 11 sig figs, we can ignore the carbon-14 when figuring out the mass. So 10 grams of carbon-12, well, we know that um, 
12 grams of carbon 12, actually we should write it like that, shouldn't we? 12 grams of carbon 12 means 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, right? So all we have to do is um, multiply this by 10 twelfths, because we have 10 twelfths as much. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. It's so hard to write. 10 to the 23rd atoms. So what this tells us is that N0 of carbon 14 is going to be this fraction, is 1.3 times 10 to the minus 12 times the number of carbon 12s, which is 10 twelfths of 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, All right? And so we can get that number. That's equal to 6.52 times 10 to the 11th. All right, that this, this is N0. We have this much carbon. When it's in equilibrium, so at the moment the, the thing died, our wood sample or whatever it is, at the moment it died, this was the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. 10 grams of carbon-12 lets us figure out how much carbon-12. So use that ratio here. So this here is N0 of carbon-14. What we're after is, um, given, a, uh, given this count rate, given this count rate, um, by the way, I should have had a negative here because delta N, delta T is the change in N. And as there are decays, N is going down. So 1.94 decays per second means delta N is minus 1.94 decays per second. Then it's going down. So given that decay rate, which you measure with a Geiger counter or something, you hold it up and you figure out on average you're getting 1.94 decays per second. To get that count rate, how long must this carbon-14 have been sitting there? So the, the two things we have to work with are first of all this. N is N0 e to the minus t over tau. We also know that delta N by delta T is equal to minus N over tau. And hey, look, this delta N over delta T, we, that's exactly what we have um, over here. What we're looking for is T. So I can actually, I can put these two things together just to get that. Um, if I multiply both sides by minus tau, minus tau delta N by delta T is equal to N. So that allows me to figure out what number of carbon-14s I have right now in order to get this decay rate. Uh, that's good. Um, I could calculate that n, but I'm just going to leave it symbolic for now. I'm going to put that in up here. Um, we have n0, so I know that minus tau delta n by delta t, which is n, has to equal n0 e to the minus t over tau. Divide both sides by n0, minus tau delta n by delta t, when I write it like this, minus tau over n0 is equal to e to the minus t over tau, or I'm going to I'll do it in another color for no good reason. Right? If we go up to here, now that I have just the e to the thing all by itself, I can take a natural log of both sides. Now, if you are worried that, oh my god, when I take a natural log of a negative number, it's going to be a problem, notice that delta n delta t is itself negative. So this whole thing is positive, even though there's a negative out front. So we'll be okay. So the natural log of minus tau over n0 delta n delta t is equal to minus t over tau, or the age of the sample is minus tau times the natural log of minus tau over n0 times delta n by delta t. And almost now we have everything we can get except wait, we have the half-life and not tau, but we know that the half-life is equal to ln2 times tau. So to get tau, I just take t1 half and I divide it by ln2. ln2 is less than one, so that'll be slightly longer. So I'll calculate that, and I'm gonna plug all the things in here. Um, so tau is equal to 5730 years, divided by the natural log of two, n0, is equal to 6.52 times 10 to the 11th. And delta N by delta T is equal to minus 1.94 seconds to the minus one. I'm notice I'm gonna have to do a unit conversion because I have years and seconds to the minus one. I need the thing inside the log to be unitless. So I will have to do that unit conversion. So let me go ahead and write out. Since I've copied N zero, I can get rid of this. Let me write out what it looks like when I plug it all in. Um, 
t is going to equal minus 5730 years divided by the natural log of 2 times the natural log of 57 minus 5730 um, years divided by the natural log of 2 times, so that's just to get tau from t1 half, that's t1 half, times n0, 6.52 times 10 to the 11th, which is just a number, it doesn't have units on it, times delta n over delta t is minus 1.94 seconds to the minus 1, and so now I have to put in the unit conversion, and I'll just do that. I know that there are 3.16 times 10 to the 7 seconds in a year, close that parenthesis, close the bracket. Now I really have all the numbers to put in, including the unit conversion, so this works right. So I'll do that in my calculator. The result of all of this is 2083 years. So to two sig figs, which I think is all we have, yeah, that is only good to two sig figs. So we have 21, sorry, 2,100 years ago. All right, 2,000 years ago, when I think I say, how old is this thing? We got 2,100 years ago. So we're talking, um, you know, 100 BC kind of things. What's going on? Or like 80-ish BC. You have Romans and Greeks and stuff. Whatever. All right, that's part A. Part B. If we think we can reliably detect decays down to one decay per 10 seconds from this sample, how old could it be before all we could do is set a lower limit on its age? Why a lower limit? So here's the thing. Once n gets small enough, right here, delta n by delta t is minus n over tau. When n is small enough, delta n by delta t gets really small below 1 decay per 10 seconds. So once this is less than 0.1 seconds to the minus 1, that's 1 decay per 10 seconds, as time goes by, n decreases. When it's small enough, we can no longer detect the decays. Thereafter, n will keep going down, and the decays will keep going down, and all we know is we don't detect it anymore. So we can figure out what's the earliest time when we stop detecting it, but it could be older than that. So to do this, it's basically all the same calculations, but I probably shouldn't have erased all of that. But the difference is now, delta n by delta t has to equal... 0.1 seconds to minus 1. That's 1 decay per 10 seconds. Which is the same as 0.1 decays per second. So it's the exact same thing. I'm going to plug in all of the same numbers. I won't write the whole thing out again. Look at what I just wrote out. So I'm going to plug in all of the same numbers, except I'm going to put a 0.1 there, and we'll see what we get. By the way, this delta n delta t should have been negative, because, of course, n is going down. And the result we get is t is equal to uh, 27,000 years. So what that means is that once, if you don't detect it, if you, if you can say that delta n delta t is less than 0.1 seconds to minus 1, right? I don't detect anything. If there was one decay per 10 seconds, I would have detected it. So I know that the decay rate is less than that. You can conclude that t has to be greater than, it's at least this old, because when it was this old, that's what the decay rate would be. The decay rate's only going to go down as it go further. So this is why it turns out carbon dating is only good. Maybe you have a more sensitive detector or a bigger sample. Carbon dating is only good for tens or maybe if you really are sensitive to hundreds of thousands of years. Um, you're not going to use carbon dating to date the solar system, for example, because it's four and a half billion years old and the half-life of carbon is way too short. Any carbon-14 left over from the beginning of the universe, beginning of the universe, beginning of the solar system would have long decayed by now. Um, all right, so those are some examples doing uh, radioactive decay. You will do more next time we meet, and that's it for the video problems.